Hi everyone, my name is Zachary Gersten. I am the technical manager for this plenary session on food systems resilience, which will be chaired by Thin Lei Win. Thank you so much for taking part in ANH 2022. Um, as you can see, we have a hybrid format today, and I just want to give a special shout out to all the guests that we have calling in. And then we also have a watch party going on today um, at Bells University in Nigeria. So welcome everyone, thanks for being here today. We really look forward to a robust, hybrid, interactive session. So thanks so much, and I'll uh, give it over to our chair to introduce. Thanks. Thanks very much, Zach, and hello everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, um, depending on wherever you're logging in from. My name is Thin, and I'm a journalist specializing in food systems and climate issues, and I'm going to be the moderator for this really interesting panel discussion, which is going to be looking at food systems transformation from a very unique perspective, asking the question as to whether circularity or circular systems are the answer. Um, now that Zach has gone through all of the housekeeping rules, I'm just going to ask our first speaker, Megan Denny, to actually uh, set the scene for the panel discussion. Megan is a researcher of circular food systems at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and her presentation will be a great way to open up this discussion. Megan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Thin, and thank you to everyone for joining us, those of you online and those of us in the room as well. It's so nice to be here in person as well. Um, so we're really looking forward to this session and very excited from the ANH side um, to host this session on resilience and circularity. We hope it's going to be a really um, fascinating discussion, and it certainly will be, I think, with the help of our experts. So um, my name is Megan Dini, as Ben said. Um, I'm a research assistant and um, PhD student um, in the Amana programme. And I'm just going to give a very brief five minute introduction to some of the concepts that we'll be discussing today. Um, and so our expert panel can really dive into the nitty gritty of the discussion. So with the help of our experts, we're going to be considering how the concepts of food system resilience and circularity interact, what these terms actually mean to different people and in different spheres of research and practice, and whether goals of resilience, sustainability, and of course, health and equity can align um, in a shared vision for food systems transformation. So let's begin with the concept of resilience. And amongst different definitions of food system resilience, we really have this kind of central concept of the ability of food systems and supply chains to um, prevent, prepare for, withstand, and also recover from shocks. And that means kind of supplying food that's accessible and available in an equitable and consistent manner to all people. And obviously, um, in the last couple of years alone, we've really been shown just how vulnerable global food systems are to all kinds of shocks. Um, of course, the pandemic and other disease outbreaks, but also extreme weather events and climate change and uh, conflict and other geopolitical crises. And I've just put a few of the numbers up here to show the kind of extent of these effects. Um, and of course, these have been very frequent, not only in the last two years, um, and somewhat kind of relentless in a way, and also acute and protracted, and they compound each other, really exacerbating those in, uh, sort of existing inequities um, and causing widespread food insecurity and malnutrition. So clearly, creating more resilient food systems absolutely has to be a priority in this era that's undoubtedly going to be fraught with further challenges, not least due to climate change. Um, however, patching up the system or strengthening the one that we currently have may not be enough. Rebuilding food systems, there's also an opportunity uh, to reimagine and rethink our current models, as has clearly been the call for many people. We've now become very used to phrases like build back better um, and other terms for this. So at the best of times, obviously, the current model is already failing to provide um, nutritious and healthy food and diets for um, kind of equitably to all people, whilst also failing to kind of support and protect the natural environment on which it depends, and also livelihoods and human rights. So we have a lot of work to do. And these are priorities that really need to be combined with resilience in order uh, to create a transformation that puts health, equity, sustainability and resilience at the fore. So current food systems are largely linear by design, and this economic model is characterized uh, by being highly resource intensive whilst generating large amounts of waste uh, emissions and pollution. And in food systems, this is combined with agricultural intensification, um, large amounts of chemical, often toxic chemical inputs, 
land acquisition uh, and deforestation, monoculture cropping, corporate power and control, and globalized supply chains that really are driving dietary transitions and unsustainable demand. So these systems are not only unhealthy, unethical, and unsustainable, they're also contributing directly to the causes of the shocks that they're then so vulnerable to. So for example, a well-known statistic is that global food systems are contributing around a third of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which of course is driving climate change and the weather-related shocks that are disrupting global food supplies. They're also found to be the primary driver of biodiversity loss, uh, mainly as a result of agricultural land use, chemical inputs, pesticides, fertilizers, um, and also the monoculture cropping. And they also produce um, vast amounts of waste, not only food waste, with around a third uh, being lost or wasted along supply chains, which obviously has an environmental impact in itself, but also material wastage, um, including plastics, um, food systems are likely to be a really leading driver of the global plastics pollution crisis. So circularity, as opposed to the linear, has been conceptualized and visualized in a number of different ways. And I've just put a few examples up here on the slide. Um, and whilst the circular economy as a term has gained significant attention and popularity in recent years, it's of course not new in principle. Um, nature works on a very much circular basis and in traditional uh, knowledge and practices, circularity is often fundamental um, such that it might not even be termed in that way. Um, so it might be more recognized um, in concepts like balance, harmony, coexistence of humans with nature, um, and also in other phrases like green econ economy, uh, urban metabolism and resource efficiency, just to name a few. But essentially the concept promotes reducing, recycling, reusing and repurposing food system resources so that we really ease the burden on raw materials and natural resources and maintain the value of those resources for as long as possible whilst reducing or potentially even eliminating waste. And so this approach might really offer a sort of critical way to make food systems more sustainable, but it might also uh, promote greater diversity in food systems and a way to sort of decentralize some of the power constructs that exist. Um, and this diversity is also quite a key strategy that's being put forward for food systems resilience. So there might be some opportunities to sort of um, co-benefits co there in that, in that approach. So we're asking, could returning to this thinking or reframing our food systems in the round be not only a way to create more environmentally sustainable food systems, but also more equitable, healthier, um, and more resilient ones? Circularity is certainly one alternative vision, um, though the relationship between environmental sustainability and food system resilience and our other important goals of health and equity is not necessarily straightforward or sufficiently understood. And there are, there are risks, of course, that these discourses develop in silos. And at best, we might miss an opportunity to sort of simultaneously work towards the same goals, or worse, we might miss trade-offs that actually um, occur because we're moving towards divergent views of the food system. So what should this transformation look like as we work towards multiple goals? How do we now square this circle? And thankfully, I will be handing over to our fantastic chair, Thin, and our brilliant panel of experts uh, to tackle these complex questions and consider whether moving from linear to circular models could be the ultimate transformation for food system resilience. We really hope you enjoy the discussion and over to you, Thin. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Megan, for that presentation. There's a lot of food for thought for the panel discussion and also the uh, Q&A later on, I'm sure. Um, like Megan said, <laughs> right, the past two years have just really brought home just how vulnerable, fragile and unequal our food systems are, right? The COVID-19 pandemic, the war in Ukraine and the horn, uh, the devastating drought in the Horn of Africa, all the examples that Megan showed have you know, just, just highlighted the problems that are inherent within the current linear food systems. So the question is, is there a way to fundamentally reconfigure them um, so that they become more equitable, more resilient and more sustainable? And can we, you know, expand this definition of secularity and think of it in a more holistic manner? 
Well, these are the questions we're going to try and answer today. And like Megan said, we have a stellar lineup of speakers who are going to try and, you know, envision a better and brighter future for us. I'm going to introduce our speakers in alphabetical order. We have First, Desta Mebratu, who is Professor at the Center for Sustainability Transitions at University of Stellenbosch, and he's also the lead for the United Nations High Level Champions Initiative on Open Waste Burning. Next, we have Hannah Van Zunpen, who is Associate Professor of Circular Food Systems at Wageningen University. We also have Mamadou Goita, Executive Director of the Institute for Research and Promotion of Alternatives and Development. Mamadou is also a founding member of the Coalition to Protect African Genetic Heritage and the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. And last, but definitely not the least, we have Nancy Rapando, leader for Africa's Food Future Initiative at the Worldwide Fund for Nature, the WWF. Um, special thanks to Nancy for stepping in at the last minute because our previous speaker had to drop out due to unforeseen circumstances. So how this is going to work is I'm going to ask a few round of questions to our speakers and then we'll open up for Q&A. Um, let me start by asking all of our speakers the same question and if they can limit their answers to maximum two to three minutes that would be fantastic. Um, so today we're going to talk about how the current linear food systems are wasteful and you know extractive and not sustainable right so in what way do you think moving these food systems towards more circular principles could improve their resilience and also, you know, could any of the work that you're doing be seen in this light? Um, I'm going to start with Nancy because WWF uh, has just launched an initiative called Our Circular Food Future, I think two days ago. So Nancy, could you just talk a little bit about this initiative? Could you tell us what it is? Okay, sorry, because of the bandwidth, I request that I'll, be, I'll not be on video. So I'll continue speaking without a video. That's fine, thank uh, you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, WWF is a conservation organization working worldwide. And uh, for WWF, uh, uh, the agriculture work, food systems work is critical because every time from a conservation perspective, uh, food is, uh, agriculture and food production is always a threat to conservation efforts. So the work on circularity fits well within WWF work. And as mentioned by Megan, there are issues around sustainable consumption and production. So WWF uh, looks forward to achieving uh, the sustainable production and uh, and consumption goals through three ways. Uh, one is through environmentally sustainable food production, where we we, we would like 50% of the area under agriculture and aquaculture uh, to be sustainably managed. We, we're also working on reduction of food waste and also working on healthy food through sustainable diets. So uh, just to talk about our work on, on environment, sustainable uh, food production, we're doing this through agroecology. And we also know that agroecology, one of the principles is on circularity. And so this allows uh, uh, agriculture, uh, food production systems to even reduce on the use of inputs, work on uh, shorter market systems. So th that's what we're doing. But I just want to uh, talk more about our initiative on food loss and waste, which we call the Circularity Initiative. And uh, just to give um, a reason why this was the, this has been developed is because uh, there's a lot of waste. Waste is happening uh, post-harvest. Waste is happening when people are shopping. We are shopping more than we need to be shopping. Uh, waste happens during cooking and also waste happens on the plate. So this initiative aims to address all those waste areas. And by doing this, we want to work with our consumers, creating awareness uh, through campaigns to understand uh, more aspects of uh, uh, our food waste uh, and circularity. We're also working on businesses because we want them to understand why food gets wasted. And we're also working to, to also reduce uh, food waste along value chain, uh, along supply chains, 
by making them more efficient. But how do we want to do this? And I think the most important thing is measurement. Uh, for you to know what you are doing, you also need to measure so that you are informed. So through measurement, we, we, we want to work with national governments uh, to measure uh, food loss and waste. And we're looking at this, that if this is done, then we would easily report this globally. Uh, just to add that uh, we, we, we also, be, beyond measuring, we, we want to work on national strategies to include aspects of circularity in food systems, uh, working with supply chains on issues of inefficiencies, but how do we also develop incentives towards food loss and waste? And another aspect aspect that we'll be working with is definitely increasing capacity and investments. And also we are looking forward to even working with students. I've seen there are a number of students here are working with them to, to support to support governments, to be able to support institutions, to ensure more integration of aspects of food loss and food waste. So in doing this, just to finish, we want to influence over 35 countries to integrate aspects of uh, food loss and waste in their, in their national plans, in their NDCs, and also we want this also to be seen in private sector strategies. So thank you so much. Uh, and our targets are we need more reporting, we need action to be taken, and we need food service businesses to really undertake food loss reduction and also report on food loss reduction. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Nancy. That sounds like a really interesting initiative and quite an ambitious one as well, looking at 35 countries and coming up with, you know, proper measurements and being able to monitor and evaluate how that works. So we'll be interested in hearing how it, you know, as, as the initiative continues, how it goes on. Mamadou, can I come to you next um, about your work and if and how circular systems, you know, could be more resilient just based on your experience working on the ground? Thanks a lot. Uh, and then this is really an opportunity to share some of the things that we are doing. Actually, uh, I think you have been mentioning some of the networks I'm engaged in, uh, talking about Copagen in West Africa, but also AFSA, uh, but also I'm a member of IPES Food. So at that level, also we are working on the food system sustainably. And I think that we don't have any no more choice than moving from this linear system to the circular one, because that we have been, even if we have not been learning a lot from the recent history of the world uh, with the three major crises in 10 years, and then that will continue in the future, the crises, that we didn't learn from them, looking at the fact that the, the, the key causes of the situation that we are having in different parts of the world is due to the way that we are perceiving uh, this linear system uh, they, uh, that is dominated by corporations, dominated by some countries also supporting these corporations and then also excluding the many, many different examples of resilience that has been happening, particularly in Africa uh, and that allow people to survive from all these crises. So uh, there is a lot to learn from that. And we are trying to work and just looking at how, uh, uh, looking at upstream and downstream of food production system that we need to look at, because you cannot talk about linear system, and this shift, this is fundamental. We are looking at the upstream system, what we are putting in production. I'm talking about all the access to resources. I'm talking about land, I'm talking about water, I'm talking about fertilizers, be them organic or not, and how we are handling, uh, uh, we are uh, considering these not as commons in most of the cases, but as private, uh, uh, private goods for some, 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 some very uh, short, very limited number of, of people. And we look at what is happening when we go from, from the production system to the market system that we are having, because this cannot be dis disconnected from the, the food system, the nutrition system that we have in different, at different level. That is related to the culture of different, of also countries, but also different uh, groups. So if you look at that, uh, yeah, I will say that we are working just to try to unpack uh, upstream and downstream processes, working on how we can change, have a, a very high paradigm shift in the food production system that is not relying on this, this extraordinary usage push for fertilizers, for chemical fertilizer, and trying to, to have more resilient system that is on, on, on with agroecological processes. Secondly, and how can we make a linkage between the food production system 
the food conservation processing where you have a concentration of women and youth. In that case, in the case of Africa, just trying to do the more processing systems in at local level, allowing to feed other people who are not producing using the third level, that is the territorial market. So how can we change the system if we don't consider that if there is a minimum of food that is going through uh, the, world, uh, the world market, the global market, and that the, the huge amount of food that we are consuming are using the territorial market that is located at different level. It can be cross-border, it can be local and, and so, and that is where that we need to have emphasis so that we can transform the food system. So we are working on this just to, uh, to show that there is no, no choice. We have to shift to move and moving means that we are considering upstream and downstream this, uh, this, uh, this food uh, system uh, 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 layers and, uh, at, at that level. So I will stop here Great. so we we'll come back and then on question. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I want to I want to dig more into it. And also, you know, what Nancy just now mentioned about agroecology. And I want to ask you about that later as well. But I want to go to Hannah now. Hannah, are you there? Uh, great. Perfect. Um, we're talking about circular food systems, right? But this is something that you and your team have been working on in, in, in Wageningen for quite a while, right? In, in detail as well. Tell us a bit great. more. Thank you so much. Yes, we have been working on this uh, concept um, for the last years. And what we did is we developed a framework which includes different circularity principles, which you can see here on this figure. And the first circularity uh, principle relates to that we have to respect the planetary boundaries. So don't overutilize our natural resources. So stop overfishing, avoid the use of artificial fertilizer, enhance biodiversity as we need biodiversity for our food production. Then the second principle is to make sure that we produce enough healthy food for everyone. And I stress the word healthy food as this also immediately relates to our, our third principle, which is about avoiding waste. So if you think about high income countries, we see actually that a lot of people overconsume, And that's also a kind of waste, because if we overconsume, we actually produce food that we would not need. But the avoid principle also relates, for example, to food losses and waste. So if we are not able to avoid waste, then we should recycle it in the most efficient way. And that's the last principle. So we can, for example, recycle byproducts um, and food losses and waste as a fertilizer. But you can also think of actually utilizing our human excreta as that's a source which is not used a lot today. And all those different organic streams you can use as a fertilizer or we can use them as feed for animals. So if you would redesign today's food system towards a more circular food system, and this is just one example, one redesign that we, we, we visualized, um, then we are able to make the food system much more resilient. Thank you. Great, I want to go a bit more in depth into that, but we'll come to that in the next round. Desta, I'm coming to you last because your expertise actually goes way beyond just food. And also thanks uh, for joining us, you know, using your mobile phone. We know you're having issues with blackouts, so we appreciate you uh, using whatever means you have uh, to be with us today. Um, just tell us a bit about, you know, your, your, your work, uh, but perhaps maybe we can start with, food waste, which is what everybody's been talking about and is part of uh, uh, your expertise. Yeah, thank you very much, Jean, and uh, greetings to, to all. Uh, very happy to be part of this, uh, this session. Uh, in our, uh, I mean, now I'm talking about my broader work on in research and development on sustainability. And our work in relation to circularity is the emphasis we put on uh, the, the importance of having the life cycle perspective. Circularity will not happen without having that life cycle perspective. So when you, when you look at any production and consumption system, you have the extraction side, you have the production or processing side, you have the distribution side, and then you have the consumption and the end of life. Uh, a, a systematic application of Circularity has to capture all of this. Now relate this to food systems. Agriculture and food production has been with us for millennia. Where did it go wrong? Where did it start going wrong? The moment it became resource intensive in, in combination with the linear nature of 
this chain, the life cycle chain. That is where the agricultural and food system became unsustainable. So extraction in terms of water, extraction in terms of nutrient and so on, all the other elements that go into the agricultural food production system, and then the processing, and then the distribution and consumption. That is where our, our challenge started to happen. So when you talk about circularity of food system, how do you get back this? I mean, in previous times, whatever we produce in subsistence agricultural economy, you produce and whatever comes out from that production process consumed, and then it goes back into the natural system. So the ecological foundation was always rejuvenating itself because of the lower load of extraction and the take back process that we have in subsistence economies. As we move away from that, our challenge of facing unsustainable agricultural production became a reality. So in order to move away from that, as, what, as it was highlighted in a, by, by the previous speakers, we have to act at various levels. It's not about a single intervention. It has to be various levels of intervention in a more integrated way. It's only through that kind of intervention. And here, I think when we talk about food systems, it's not, it's not only agricultural production, it's also the agro processing where most of the unsustainable inefficient practice happens both in terms of food production and nutrient value also. So there are a number of uh, level of interventions that we can consider when we talk about food systems. And I think I will come back to the, the, the West is related to the end of life part. How do you deal with it? I'll come back to that in the next round of the, the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Desta. I mean, fascinating and 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 such a, an important point to to emphasize that it's not just the production, but also the processing and other steps that needs to be considered as well when we're talking about secularity. And and you, you know, sort of explaining it, it made me realize that you know that this is the natural, so you, you know, way things are. Done, it's always been secular, right? So in a way, the linear systems are the uh, almost like the unnatural state. Um, but I want to I, I want to stick with you because I have a follow up question about the waste, like you said, the end of life, you know, uh, uh, stage. Can you tell us a bit more about this relationship between you know waste and the wider circular system in general? Um, and I think um, we have a diagram um, that you want to show, and we're going to try and see if we can show it from our end because you're calling in via phone and you can't share the slide. Can we uh, try and share that that diagram so that uh, uh, when Dexter is speaking? Yeah, while while the diagram comes up, I can uh, talk about it uh, in relation to my. Uh, other responsibility with the United Nations high-level champions. Uh, we produced recently a report titled uh, Open, Open West Burning in Africa, Challenges and Opportunities. And as highlighted in this report, 60% uh, of the waste that is coming out from African urban centers is biodegradable. 20% of it is recyclable. Everything goes into either open dumping sites or it, will, it gets burned out. It's only about 11% of the overall waste generated in Africa that is properly uh, disposed in sanitary landfills. So according to UNEP, Africa is missing uh, an economic opportunity that amounts to $8 billion per year due to its inability to get back the useful, the useful part of waste back into the system. So when it comes to the biodegradable waste, as was indicated earlier, it can be processed into a number of useful products. It can be uh, processed as a compost and get back into the system as fertilizer. It can be uh, processed through, uh, for example, black, black, black fly soldiers process that will convert it into animal feed. Uh, producing worms and feeding into chickens and so on. It can generate energy. So it has various uh, useful value that could be generated from uh, the volume of waste that we have. And th that goes also true for other recyclable material. Besides the change that you could see, uh, the major change that should happen is in the consumption and production side, which I have talked earlier. 
that once you have the West, you have all these different level of possibilities to take it back into the economic system by generating additional values. And by the way, for African countries, this is also about creating jobs. Uh, I mean, tens of thousands of informal West service providers and recyclers are the ones that are filling the gap today in terms of West management failure in Africa. So if we can work with these informal West service providers and recyclers, organize them, provide them the technical backup support, give them the institutional uh, support that they need and engage them in value creation for West, there could be a lot of value that could be generated both economically, socially, and environmentally. And that is how I think we can replenish whatever we take out of the natural system, get it back into the system in different forms so that we will continue in a more uh, sustainable production and consumption pattern. And this is just one example that we are currently working on. Just finally, as, as an information, we are, we, are, we are working on launching a multi-partnership uh, initiative on phasing out open burning of waste from Africa by 2040, and this is to be launched at COP27 in Egypt. And I think that will provide us a good basis to move forward. Thank you and over to you. Great, thanks so much, Dasa. Um, very interesting model and diagram. Um, speaking of mod models, Hannah, um, coming back to you again, can you tell us a bit more about the model that you're using to assess the three principles that you mentioned earlier? Yes, thank you. So over the last years, we, we developed those different principles, uh, but then the big question was, of course, what will happen if we assess them? Because those principles we developed based on different studies that we did, but all those studies were still assessing one part of the food system. So one particular component of the food system. And then we realized that as long as we actually assess those different components of the food system, we always, we never get this complete picture. So therefore over the last six years, we have developing a model which is called CFOS, the circular food system model. And with this model, we aim to reduce the environmental impact in terms of land use, greenhouse gas emissions, and pea and water use, while at the same time making sure that we produce a healthy diet for everyone. And with that, I mean that we produce the nutrients that we need on a daily basis, so protein, vitamin B12, and so on. But at the same time, also make sure that we produce the right foods. So don't overconsume, for example, processed red meat, or sugars or producing of fibers and so on. So the model is ready for Europe. And what we did is we um, divided Europe in different zones based on climate and soil conditions. And in each of those different zones, the, crop, the model can select a certain crop. And this crop will be processed into food. And during that processing step, we also create leftovers such as crop residues and byproducts, such as for example, wheat middlings. We also create a certain amount of food waste and human excreta. We also have the byproducts from the animals and the manure from these animals. So part of those leftover streams can be used as organic fertilizer and part of them can be used as animal feed. So we are actually feeding the animals with the leftovers of the food system. And the animals then again produce uh, high quality foods. And we can make use of fisheries, which also provides us nutrients. So at the end, the model tells us which crops to grow where, which animals should we keep, how many animals and what should we feed those animals, which fertilizers should we use, and at the end, what should we actually consume. And what we did is we created a baseline, so it gives the current situation of today, and then we optimized it in terms of the environmental impact and in terms of a healthy diet, and that gives you a kind of a dot on the horizon. And what we do now is to actually create different transition pathways to come from this current situation towards that dot on the horizon and see how can we actually do that. So we also make this tailor-made so it actually accounts different social and economic conditions. And by doing so, we can redesign the food system um, towards a sustainable food system. So we have this ready for Europe, but we are upscaling it to a global scale too. So we can cover all the different countries. Thank you. That's really interesting. I'd be, I think, you know, be fascinated to hear what a global model would look like once once you have it as well. Um, 
Nancy, can I come to you um, um, after Hannah? Because you mentioned earlier heritage foods, right? As one of the three things that, that, that you're looking at. Are indigenous knowledge and traditional practices good examples of circular systems? Can you explain a bit more? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Kim. Uh, we, we all do understand that a number of innovations really originate from indigenous knowledge, whether they are remain indigenous or transformed through formal science to be called technologies and innovations. But what I know that most of what we do quite, uh, we have quite a, a good amount of information borrowed from indigenous information. I just want to refer to some aspects of managing food food waste that has been food loss and waste that has been used in Africa. For example, the issue of milk powdering has a lot of um, origin. We have communities in countries like Kenya who for a number of years could dry the milk and then this milk uh, would then form powder. And then we also have a lot of roasting of meat uh, and fish, uh, what we call smoked fish. And in doing this, such fish is able to last longer uh, and such fish is also able to, to be moved across a different towns to be marketed rather than rotting. We, we know that the triple bagging or the, uh, I think the triple bagging, the use of hematic bags originates a lot from the Africa perspective of putting our cereals inside a pot and then locking the, it very tight so that insects don't come in. So what happens is that most of this indigenous knowledge is being adapted based on the biophysical and social conditions that are in different areas and also to serve modernization because pots are not still there, but the sacks can be used. Uh, we've seen in countries like Nigeria, the fermentation of food and and allowing it to stay longer are also based on indigenous systems. Uh, we know that one of the innovations that like biochar has a lot to do with communities that have been burning the, uh, that have been burning the, the agricultural uh, waste and then leaving it on the farm and then discovering that th these areas are even giving them more uh, more yields. And so uh, this, this goes into using technologies like biochar. So I, I just want to emphasize that um, indigenous people are dynamic innovators and uh, they can be a good source of information as we enter into the circular economy systems, including even waste management aspects. Thank you so much. That's fascinating. Thanks, Nancy, for giving us such concrete examples as well. And I think that's really helped us to visualize how, you know, the, these indigenous practices and knowledge fits into the circularity principles. Mamadou, where do regional food sovereignty and agroecological, you know, transitions fit in? This is something that you've been working on for a very long time, right? Thank you. Um, you know that Africa has been, um, just uh, resisting for a long time against the model that was imposed to, to it. Uh, if you look at the trends, even uh, fertilizer usage, uh, uh, while we are less than 10 kilograms of chemical fertilizers uh, per hectare, so the rest of the world is about 107 kilograms per hectare. So um, because, because people have been understanding that the, the traditional knowledge that are behind the perception of food production is very far from the model that has been imposed to it. Uh, the, the Green Revolution model, we just released a report on, on trying to assess what the Green Revolution model has been bringing to Africa and the resistance that has been, some countries that have been resisting has been more, more sustainable than uh, many others. So working on the principles of post sovereignty, working with the environment, trying to put resources the ownership of resources in the hand of those who are producing, and then also making it circular in the sense that we are the kind of market that is more appropriate just to make food available for those who need it, and at the same time to create wealth and the local revenue instead of emphasizing on maximizing the profit for a handful of people. So we minimize the risk of being in trouble at the, at the food system level than maximizing profit. So look at that. The resistance has brought just to rely on the traditional way of, 
cross producing, but also the way that people are circulating. This is why also the uh, issue of seeds is an, a typical example that we have in my country, for instance. 73% of all the seed that you use in my country are what we call farmer seeds. They have power on, on giving as gifts, sharing it, selling it, or reproducing it. So they are not unproductive uh, productive uh, seed system that has been imposed to that. So this is because of one of the key principles of the control of the resources in the hand of those who are producing is very uh, 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 key and instrumental for the food sovereignty uh, model. And also, if you look at the food reserve system that we have, because in West Africa, for instance, you have three levels of defense in terms of food reserve. We have the local level with the, with the, with the, the, the several banks that we have. And in some part of my country, you know, all the community will have a minimum of five years of food reserve just to face, to be more resilient when there is there are problems like the one that we have been known actually. And the second level of resilience also is at the, on, on food reserve is at national level. When we have in all the West African countries actually what we call the, uh, the national food security stocks that we are transforming to food sovereignty stock that can also be used for the regulation of the market uh, 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 distortion that are happening also at, at that, that, that time. And then we have the third level, that is the, the regional food reserves. West Africa with ECOWAS is now having experimenting for the last 10 years, the regional food reserve. So that is also used not only uh, to allow farmers to sell the production when, when they are just, the prices are down, and then to, to keep the price at the level that they can continue to produce and then to renew the tools and then all, all these. But at the same time, if there is problem with the prices at the market for consumers, which, which also this, this food reserve will also be used to regulate that. So this means that there are some instruments also actually that are linked to our, our traditions, you know, our knowledge, traditional knowledge that need to be highlighted so that we can, we can just get, get the model that are imposed to us by the Green Revolution model, but also other system that is keeping all the food uh, uh, on the hand of uh, the hand and food. Uh, cooperation. Great. Thanks so much, Mamadou, and particularly the multiple levels of resilience, right? Since we're talking about whether secularity can help resilience, it's really interesting to hear the multiple levels of that. Um, I have a couple of questions coming in, and I want to, for, for this last round of questions, I want to focus on the practicalities um, of these models and the feasibility. And Hannah, I want to come to you first. Um, you know, you gave a very compelling model and you've taken into consideration lots of different things. Um, but what kind of changes are you recommending? And will, will the model re re really work in practice, in reality? Yeah, thank you. So what we found over the last years based on the different studies that we did is that changes are indeed required in terms of consumption and production. And I think this is very important to stress that it's not only production changes, but also consumption changes. They need to go hand in hand. Uh, related to consumption changes, it's important to make sure that we go towards a healthy diet that we keep a ratio between animal and plant-based proteins in the form of like 30 to 40% max animal proteins and around 70, uh, 60 to 70% plant-based proteins. And that we make sure that we stop wasting a lot of the food that we have. Related to production, it's important that we produce the crops that provides us the nutrients that we need on a daily basis. So, for example, not too much sugar crops, uh, but crops that are producing nutrients that we need, actually. Then, for example, um, reduce, at least in high income countries, it also means a reduction in the animal numbers and feeding animals, uh, mainly with products that we cannot or uh, do not want to consume ourselves. And that we use also the organic fertilizers that we have available so that we don't waste them. So, and in general, of course, it's important to reduce the amount of waste that we have available. So how can the model help us with this? What the model can is, well, the most important thing is that we look at the food system holistically so that we don't start focusing on solutions that we think will help us, but might result in trade-offs somewhere else. So what the model can do is it can avoid those trade-offs and can help to define transition pathways towards more sustainable food systems without creating those trade-offs somewhere else. Then of course the model provides can provide you thousands of redesigns 
Uh, and which one should we then pick? So I think, first of all, this should be something which is really tailor-made to every single situation. But what is also very important is that we have to do this together because we have to agree together on what do we actually aim for? What do we, where do we go? And what we are therefore also doing is translating the model into a kind of game in which we can sit together with different stakeholders and redesign the food system together. So you can provide different boundaries and, and different, so let's say different visions that then will shape the food system. So we hope to have that ready somewhere uh, in the beginning of next year. And if you're interested in joining one of those sessions that we will organize, you're very, very welcome uh, to send me an email and I'm uh, happy to collaborate with you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And Hannah, you might want to then share your uh, contact details in the chat box so that people can, can contact you for, for the future. Um, it sounds fascinating, particularly the fact that it can be tailored to individual circumstances and it's not a one size fits all. Dasta, your turn. I have the same question as, as Hannah, but obviously you have a much wider macro perspective. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, we need to put emphasis on uh, uh, balancing nature-based nutrition with technology-driven. I think that is, that is the most to the food systems. And with indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge system, it, it, it provides a lot of benefit. Uh, I, I mean, just to give you one example in terms of crop genetic protection and conservation, the, the traditional societies have very good way of conserving crop diversity. One of the things we talked about linearity, one of the things uh, we, we are facing today is homogeneity in terms of agriculture naturally exists, those who are genetically modified and so on. By the way, the malt industry was, was faced with a disaster in 1970s due to a certain pesticide that, that attacked the most of the major uh, malt barley producing plantations. What saved the global malt industry is the malt variety, the, the, uh, the, barley, the barley variety that came out from Ethiopian farmers. The Ethiopian farmers provide the savior for the global malt industry. If we continue with the way of this homogeneous har har uh, push for single crops, modified crops and so on, our food system will be fundamentally in a major disastrous situation. So the problem of West is very much related to how we produce and consume the whole chain. The more we equation, the range we face from West. So it is very important to recognize nature-based solution with indigenous knowledge, of course, with the support of technological solution, but technology will not save us from what we are facing today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jester. I'm really sorry that the connection wasn't better um, because what you were saying was was really interesting, particularly um, you know the homogeneity and 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 how circular system could be could be a way to sort of prevent um, uh, what could possibly be a collapse of of some of the the the, the staple food varieties that that, that we rely on. Um, Mamadou, can a circular system also help with the deconcentration of corporate power and promote equity, um, some of the issues that you uh, talked about earlier? Yeah, of course, as I mentioned, so upstream and downstream, there is a concentration of power in the hand of uh, uh, some corporations and some countries. So just trying to uh, uh, just to change the mindset uh, in terms of production system, using more open um, uh, uh, resources, uh, just as controlled by those who are producing allowing also for this paradigm shift on the kind of market that we are promoting. So using more territorial market uh, for circulating agricultural product. Also changing the mindset of uh, consumers. You know? Some of the uh, 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 consuming habits are changed drastically in some countries where these countries are now import dependent uh, uh, on wheat or rice and, and, and the like. But those countries that have been resisting you know, keeping the food system as it is and the system that we have have been really more resilient. So the story tells us that there is a need actually just uh, that this opening, this uh, paradigm shift, you know, in just relying on this circular model will, will, will deconcentrate, you know, the power of the, the corporations. And the example is actually on the fertilizers companies 
uh, uh, they are completely destabilized in West Africa, uh, mainly in my country, actually, because of the fact that we are shifting to more than 60% of the fertilizer, fertilizers that are used in my country will be uh, organic fertilizers. Farmers are producing individually in their farms, don't creating also uh, uh, their, their own uh, independence in terms of just having access for this resource production. And they are also changing uh, our, 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 our seed law, the new seed law that we are, we are now actually uh, 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 trying to, to draft is, is uh, based on the, on the farmer seed system because we just realized that depending on, on, the, on, on corporations in the, food, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the seed system will completely destabilize you know, our food production system. So these are some of the things that show that we can deconcentrate power from, the, uh, from these companies in just changing the way that we are looking at the, at the food system actually uh, in a circular way. That's great. Thanks, and Mamadou. Last question to Nancy before we open up the floor to Q and A. Uh, Nancy, how you know you talked very eloquently just now and gave examples about you know indigenous knowledge and traditional practices. How possible uh, is it to replicate um, some of these? I think you, Tin. I'll take a very short time. Uh, uh, we all understand that our replication helps uh, to ensure historical continuity of indigenous knowledge, uh, whether it is being replicated within the same place or outside the areas. But uh, when it comes to replicating indigenous knowledge, it's very critical that we, we appreciate that this knowledge is rooted on biophysical and social context. And so if you have to, to re replicate it with the, to, add to a different environment or to a different context, there'd be a lot of need for fabrication, probably modernization and beautification. Uh, if it is a population that really appreciates that uh, this requires to be like a sexy model. And that is why I, when I was talking about the triple backing uh, that was uh, uh, originated from first putting the cereals in pods, then there was putting the cereals in plastic jerry cans, and then now we have ended up with the triple bagging. So that shows that one innovation had to go through like three three systems so that it becomes like an innovation that can be used all over. And you never know with time where such innovation would end at. Another thing about replication is a, a, a dealing with markets. When you look at the issue of smoking fish or drying meat, uh, markets like South Africa, you'll get this in the supermarkets. People are able to carry this along. It is easily packaged. So indigenous knowledge can be pushed out through science. It can be pushed out through markets, and it can also be pushed out through policy work where policies really support some of these indigenous knowledge to really go beyond. But it is necessary that we appreciate the communities that develop this knowledge. And so issues of uh, uh, ensuring that communities are appreciated and if possible, they're incentivized when you're taking away this knowledge, I think becomes very critical. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, uh, Nancy, for that. Really great examples again. Um, we're going to open up uh, the conversation for Q&A. And the first question is from Deepak Sharma, who said that we're they're exploring examples of food system transformation using the concept of secularity in farming at the field level. Um, and he's asking whether there are any frameworks available, particularly on the use of secularity within overall farming and food systems. That's question number one. Um, second question is from Savannah um, Omali. I'm sorry if I <laughs> uh, mangled your name. Um, um, she said that, you know, circularity can introduce challenges, for example, you know, reintroducing pathogens but into the food system from reusing human waste. How can we address these challenges, for example, policies, infrastructure and regulations that promote efficiency and food safety. Hannah, I know that this is something that you've thought about, so perhaps it, you, you, can, you can take that question. And Nilupa uh, Gunaratha asked um, the panel in general to please talk more about how consumer demand can be changed to support these shifts. So we've talked about how, right, reconfiguring to a circular system is better, but how can we actually get consumers to be part of it so that they, they support these ships. Um, so that's the first round of question. 
first question is about any frameworks um, uh, on the field level, overall farming and food systems um, for using circularity. Second is uh, essentially prevention in terms of food safety and, and making sure that things like pathogens don't get reintroduced and other challenges. And the third is just um, how to get consumers to be involved. Um, anyone wants to go first or shall I start um, asking uh, um, the, the speakers? Nancy, I see that you've unmuted yourself. Do you want to do you want to start? OK, let me just talk about the issues around consumers um, and how can we make consumers be part of this? And I think it's clear that our initiative will also be working with consumers and especially creating awareness. And at times we just need to educate consumers on how they need to be conscious of their of their consumption systems, how they need to be very smart in the way they are shopping, how they need to be very smart when, when they have this food and how some of the food they call waste is not really waste. And so aspects around also coming up with different recipes and sharing such recipes with consumers on how to convert what they call waste into actual food also becomes very critical. So the most critical thing is make consumers aware and make them also aware on the impacts of their wasteful characteristics to the planet. And a number of them will be convinced. Thank you so much. And I think that, that that's what I can uh, plug in on that, yeah. Great, thanks so much, Nancy. Um, Hannah, um, do you want to respond to the question around the um, pathogens and food safety? Yeah, I saw another question coming on as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I will. So indeed, I mean, that, that's completely true. We have to be very careful related to food, uh, food safety issues. Um, what I know is that uh, in some Asian countries, people are actually already looking at how can we separate waste streams. And I think this is very, this is key to make sure that we actually separate the waste streams. We have to separate the plant based from the animal based waste and find also uh, technologies that can actually help us to see if we actually, in fact, if this all went well. So having a test at the end to see if it indeed is only plant-based and if we can separate this. So if we can separate the plant-based from the animal-based, then there are also ways of processing this. So heat treating it before uh, we are using it. And then if we heat treat it, it becomes little pellets and then we can start using it as animal feed. So I think technology can play an important role here. Uh, I do completely agree that it requires a big change in the infrastructure, which is already challenging. So this um, does require indeed, again, a, a really a redesign of the food system. And that's also what I mean, that we have to look at this holistically. So if we don't do this, then yeah, it will result in trade off somewhere else. Thank you. Great, thanks, Hannah. Um, uh, Dasta, Mamadou, anything you want to add, particularly in terms also of uh, the question around whether there are any, um, you know, frameworks that can be used um, at the field level? Yeah, no, in terms of framework, you know, actually, um, so the, the uh, what we call the farmer, farmer's agroecology model. So there is a framework that is around uh, uh, this that can be used just to to have these linkages between the food production system, the food uh, uh, market system, and the food consumption system. That is uh, this triangle and how that are, they are interlinked and how this uh, verticality and transversality of, uh, of, of this model you know, will allow just to, to, to unpack uh, the, the trap that many farmers are in actually uh, uh, using fertilizers, but also just push to to, to go with production data oriented toward the international market. So not putting too much effort and resources on this kind of product and relying on what is happening for the food stuff first, and then that can create also condition for that. So this is the framework that we use. And in terms of consumers, uh, I want to add just one thing. Uh, the problem actually is that uh, there have been, uh, it's, it's, this is the, the international uh, rules of, of trade that are in really, uh, instrumental in creating this distortion between what people are, put, are producing in their own country and the, and the subsidized product that are coming out of uh, the, 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 the national territory. So there have been a, a kind of invasion of uh, our markets uh, uh, pushing to the level of consumption that we are in. And I think that slowly in different countries, actually in Africa, 
I can see there is a change. So with consumers organizations that, that, that now evolve in, uh, in opening doors for uh, visiting farmers groups and then creating more a kind of empathy between uh, consumers and, and producers is a good step when we can just have this. So these open spaces, when you have multi-stakeholders spaces where consumers and, uh, and, and, and producers have a chance to talk, to discuss, and this is what Ropa is doing actually in West Africa with this space that is open. And even uh, uh, the, the regional traders you know, are also called in this dialogue just to see that they can create wealth in the region without just exporting and importing rice from uh, a different part of the world when finally we'll kill the food production system in our, our region. So there is, there, is a, there, is, there is enough material actually in terms of mm. framework just to move from the, the, the linear system to the, to the circular system. Great. Thanks, Mamadou. Dester, did you want to add anything before we... Yeah, uh, yeah but in fact, uh, when it comes to some uh, possible frameworks, uh, I, I think it will be it will be useful to search for uh, uh, regenerative agriculture practices that are happening across the world. There are so many models and cases where this regenerative agriculture is being practiced in different parts of the world even if they don't call it circularity, or so these groups of regenerative agriculture practitioners uh, are more or less following the same path of uh, moving out more circulation at, at four, uh, at four o'clock. I, I have, I have replied, I, I think the sound is not stable, but I have replied to one question uh, in, the, in the chat box. So I will leave at that. Thank uh, you for, for the person to to check it out. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Dasta. I'm so sorry about the connection issues, but I think I think we got the recommendation that you give. Just three more quick questions for the next round before we close, um, and perhaps uh, Hannah and Dasta, some of it might be uh, quite suitable for you. But let's. The, so the first question. Uh, again, from Savannah, is that you know my understand that her understanding of circular systems is that they have high time burden and labor. Um, is that is that the, generally the case? That's number one question. Um, a second one is Hannah. It's directed at you from Deepak Sharma, um, asking: Is there work done at Wageningen or other university on an index to measure circularity of food systems um, at different levels, village, local, national, and regional? And the third question is, you know, is that um, even in high income countries, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, vulnerable uh, communities and people uh, are struggling with hunger. You know, how can we create policies uh, for changes of consumer without actually, you know, providing safety nets uh, 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 when, when there's so much food insecurity in the world? Um, so three questions again. Um, Hannah, do you mind if I if I start with you again because there's a, a, something directed towards you, and I think Desta, you probably have some some things to add as well. I'll come to you next. Yeah. So so related to the different skills, I think this is an extremely important uh, topic. So um, there are papers in, in which this is addressed, but it's there are no papers in which this is assessed. And I think this is something that we would like to do. Um, so for example, someone uh, within our group, he also has a model which is farm design, which is on a farm level. Um, and I think what we hope to do is also to combine those different levels. So from the farm to these zones, which are in the model, and then you can go up to a continent and so on. Because if you do this, what, what we now have in the model is that the highest level of detail is a zone. And that tells you which crops to grow where and how many animals to keep, but it doesn't relate to what the farmer actually is doing. So it doesn't relate to, okay, how many farmers do we have in this zone? What are they growing there? And how can we, how can they actually come to a farming system, which is also from an economic point uh, feasible? And by combining such different models, we can actually start assessing this. But this is, of course, it's a big challenge and it's a big, it's a new field uh, that we are exploring. So, yeah, hopefully more about in the future. But I don't know uh, others that are actually combining farm uh, models um, with, with bigger or even global models. Yeah. Um, Desta, do you have uh, anything to add, particularly in terms of how circular models perhaps uh, have a, a more investment of time and labor? Well, I, I think in my opinion, uh, yes, circularity would require 
the engagement of many, many partners and actors. And innovation, innovation is, is something that will happen at various levels. So if you are taking it as a institutional process, a relation that is expressed by participatory and more uh, bottom-up kind of process for uh, applying circularity, uh, it, it, it facilitates innovation at every level. Uh, of course, it requires effort, but it's, it's not, uh, the effort is, is worth the, the, the result that it could, it could generate at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Desta. We're going to end in a few minutes. Can I, can I, can I, yes. Can, can, yeah, yeah, very, very quickly. No, for, for this, because during the transition period, you know, for sure that there, there are effort to be made. And the, the, this is just because the, the, the level of destruction has been so high in some cases that there is a lot that can be done. But if you look at the trends, actually, uh, because one of the big efforts is about Fertilize, uh, fertilization of, uh, of soils and uh, the fertility of soil issue to repair what has been completely de destroyed. But at the very beginning, you can use, for instance, as an example, we have many examples here, uh, to use uh, uh, organic manure. So you use it at the very beginning, between two tons or five tons per hectare at the very beginning. And after doing that for three years, you will just realize that you spend years and years without even putting a single quantity of fertilizer on this land. So it's at, uh, for the transitional period to rebuild, we fix things, there will be an effort, but that efficiency of yields will come out and then we'll see that the effort will be less. And then even all the risk that people are taking in some of the, as some of the level in processing, in conserving and, and all these. So there is a lot that we gain, gain in terms of time and effort too. So it's the transitional period that is demanding in terms of effort, but things will change. Uh, progressively when we move forward. Great, thank you so much. Um, Nancy, any last thoughts uh, before I sum up? Tim, uh, I think it has been a, a good discussion on issues of circularity, but I think we have a, a big uh, opportunity from where we stand in our countries to see how our countries will be uh, developing action plans, whether it is the NDCs, where there are food systems policies to integrate aspects of circularity, aspects of, of managing food loss and food waste. But most critical from an African perspective is our problems with soil, our problems of food security, uh, and our problems of accessing seed, need really to be resolved using the circularity uh, system. So that's what I can say. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Nancy. And in fact, you know, that is, uh, I think, a great uh, parting shot. Um, we've talked about circularity uh, and circular principles on a more holistic viewpoint. We have seen models from, from Hannah. We've heard examples from Nancy and Mamadou, wider macro view from Desta um, in terms of why circularity could help improve you know, resilience and make it more equitable, uh, make all of our food systems uh, uh, reconfigure them to make it also more sustainable and environmentally friendly. Um, there's obviously a lot of work to be done, investment to be made, perhaps time and labor, but maybe the outcome is uh, uh, in the long run will be much more beneficial than what we have now. Um, this has been a fascinating discussion um, and I'm really sorry that we have to uh, end it now because we have run out of time. I thank all of our fantastic speakers for their time. Can we all give them a virtual round of applause, please? And thank you also to our audience um, for your participation and, and, and for being with us, even though I've uh, we've ran over the time a little bit. It's been an absolute pleasure chairing this discussion.